Welcome back to the show, everybody. Our next guest uh, made history when she risked her life to become the first woman to host her own talk show in Afghanistan, one of the world's most dangerous places for women to live. Moshta Jamal Zadai is known as the Oprah of Afghanistan for boldly speaking out about women's rights. Now she's sharing her story in her new book, Voice of Rebellion, written by Roberta Staley. Please welcome activist and award-winning talk show host, Moshta Jamal Zadai. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. So I want to go back uh, to the beginning of your story because it really is a harrowing and fascinating one all at the same time. Uh, you were born in Afghanistan, but you and your family were forced to flee during the Civil War there. This is about 30 years ago. And you were five years old when you finally made your way here to Canada. So what was it like for you, given that very um, tumultuous early several years of your life, to land here in this country? Well, when I first came here, of course, it was a major struggle. You know, the language barriers and the racism and everything that I had to endure as a child, um, not being, feeling isolated with my family still back there. It was just me, my brothers, and my parents. And I, it was just a culture shock and everything. But, you know, it did beat um, having rockets fly over my head when I was playing in the playground with my, my cousin, for example. So, you know, if you compare it to that, it wasn't as bad as what I had gone through in Afghanistan. So. Yeah. It, it, but it, it was a struggle. Music was also the conduit and the vehicle that actually got you back to Afghanistan. Exactly. So at the time, things were changing in Afghanistan, and there was the idea for the show Afghanistan's Got Talent yes. to happen, and for you to somehow be involved in that. So now you're in your early to mid-20s. There's an opportunity for you to go back to Afghanistan, which you're contemplating. But for your parents, what were they saying about their daughter who wanted to go back to the country that they fled from. What was that like for them? That was a struggle for me to convince them to allow me to go back to Afghanistan. You know, I always felt like a, I had left my heart back there and my family, my, my friends just felt, just being around my, you know, Afghan people, like I just, I missed it so much and I wanted to go badly, but you know, they, it was a struggle to convince them to let me go because here they had worked so hard to flee the country and now I'm, I'm trying to go back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then the story moves on from there because instead of agreeing to host Afghanistan's Got Talent, you made your own pitch. And you said, <laughs> I don't want to do that show. I want to do a show kind of like a show that a woman named Oprah Winfrey does. Um, how did producers react to that? Well, the interesting part about this is that I was very happy and satisfied with, you know, hosting um, Afghanistan's Got Talent. And all of a sudden, um, my mom, she goes into the meeting, the first meeting, and she just throws us, uh, throws us out there and everybody's kind of like caught by a surprise. And she goes, well, if, you know, my daughter's going to come to Afghanistan, risk her safety and be away from her family and everything that she loves back home, then I want it to be for a good reason, for a good cause. And have you ever seen the Oprah show? And the producers are like, ah, oh, well, who's Oprah? What's Oprah? And then they, <laughs> you know, they give, um, she, she handed them a DVD set. She goes, this is your homework, watch this. You know, to the producers and directors, she's like, we'll talk about this tomorrow. The next day they come in and they're like, we love this woman, Oprah. And we want to make a show just like the Oprah show. <laughs> So what happened was they, they actually, like, they forgot all about Afghanistan's God Talent and just moved on to the Mujda Show and focused on that. Well, that, there it was. And the Mujda Show was born, and yes. it became a huge success it did, yeah. in Afghanistan. And uh, you then, at that point, became known as the Oprah of <laughs> Afghanistan. Uh, and that was in media gave me that. Right? Name. <laughs> well, this is what I was going to say. That wasn't just from fans. It turns out Oprah herself gave you also that name, which is like, what? <laughs> uh, but listen, you were tackling big stuff. It wasn't just like sort of light or fluffy entertainment. You were tackling big things like divorce and child abuse, child marriages as yes. well. I can't imagine that this all went over just so easily in Afghanistan. So what was it, the reaction to your show? It absolutely did not go easily um, in that country. And, you know, I, I was warned. They're like, well, this isn't America. This is not the Oprah show. So, you know, you're not going to get audiences. And, you know, the things kind of go in the same way where audience members will actually speak out or come on stage and discuss their issues. So we made, um, we had actors 
and we made skits and we you know presented situations in that way and we started with child abuse and you know light things in the beginning just so we could have because you know the the man in the household controls the remote control and we're like okay well if we want to keep that chance if we want to keep them watching our show we need to you start to with the their man hearts. In the house exactly right. start with their hearts slowly get into the minds and um so we started uh, discussing light subjects and then moved on to more and more taboo subjects. And I, I know for a lot of people here, it's all normal, but you know, back there, um, a lot of these uh, subjects aren't even talked about or discussed within the household, let alone like um, out in public. So that was, that was very challenging and um, the important dangerous. The important thing though that your show did, it allowed women to reimagine what their life could be like, to think outside yeah. of the boxes that they had been put in. Exactly. But the thing is, your show was still considered radical even after the Taliban fell yes. in 2001. And you were getting threats really not from the Taliban, but from government, mm -hmm. uh, from people that were hardliners just in society. Yeah. What was it like living with that kind of fear day to day? Well, there was one, there were uh, uh, two episodes that we recorded without with me without the hijab, not wearing the hijab, and they, the government actually removed those. Uh, they didn't allow those to air. Um, I was constantly living in fear. There were always um, threats coming into the TV station, um, you know, that if, if you don't remove this girl and this show, we're going to bomb the TV station. And that was a big risk that the TV was taking. Um, I would have to uh, travel in armored vehicles and change my route, and there were, you know, armed guards uh, all the time with AK-47s with me, you know, um, different, different scenarios, different situations. So it was just like um, I had a, uh, a gun under my pillow constantly and uh, like a, a gun in my purse when I was traveling because I couldn't even trust the guards to me. Wow. So it was just, it was very difficult. Well, your show lasted over two years and eventually though the threats got so bad that you did finally have to leave Afghanistan just for the, the fact of securing your life. Yes. Even the Canadian embassy said, you gotta go now. It is far too dangerous for you to stay. Yes. So what was that like leaving everything that you had built behind and especially what did that do to your fight for women and children, especially in Afghanistan? Because you had to do it from afar. Uh, it was devastating to actually have to leave my show and you know they finally succeeded in, in canceling my show or having it canceled and it was devastating because I felt defeated and all I wanted to do was help people and I wasn't able to do that anymore and so I came back here it took me a very long time to get out of that devastation and get back up and say you know what I'm I, I continued going back you know so we I go back a little bit more discreetly now. So every four to seven months, I go back for special occasions like Eid and Persian New Year. But very discreetly, I go, I do the concerts and the big, you know, the, the shows and guest appearances. And then I get out and then I go on social media like, hey, I just, you know, I, I, I after don't. After you've really, gone. After yeah. I've gone out. Yeah. 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 Hashtag late post. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is Afghanistan like today? Um, you mean for women or yes. just in general? For women, I think there has been um, much improvement. Uh, not nearly as much as it, you know, as there needs to be to be at par with the rest of the world in terms of um, where women stand, women and girls. Um, but I think that uh, it still has a long way to go. And, you know, a lot of the men still have that, uh, because extremism has kind of take taken over that region and plagued that region, it's, it's very difficult for, you know, to get through to the men and even women. Some women actually do believe that, you know, they, they deserve to be treated that way because they're a woman. They've just, just been um, molded to think that it's okay to be abused because that's a woman's job to, to be treated uh, the way that they are. And, you know, men, even some Afghan men in the West still have a lot of um, restrictions on, yes. on the women in their households. Mm -hmm. Oh, Melissa, thank you so much for being here. And thank sharing you guys for having your amazing me. story. The book is called Voice of Rebellion, and you're all going home with a copy today. Woo!